I went to Kinabalu to climb mountain, right? To get to the peak, of, it's about 4,000 feet. And at 2 a.m., you continue climbing, it's dark, you know, you just have a torchlight. And then all you can see is the next step. And then you take one step at a time, one step at a time, three hours of one step at a time. <laughs> and then you turn around. Welcome to Open House, where every conversation opens a new perspective. Today, we have Mr. Mustafa Kamal, uh, co-founder and CEO of the Black Hole Group, a multi-million dollar F&B outfit that prides itself on rebelling against the current. Welcome to Open House, Mr. Mustafa. And Thank you, you know, your entrepreneurial journey is very, very inspirational. Could you share with us a little about, you know, what makes the Black Hole Group so successful? The reason why Black Hole Group can get to where it is today is because we've never focused on the what. We've never really focused on, on we like Mexican food, so we need to have a Mexican restaurant. It's never been that. Mm. It's always been very value-driven about who we are, uh, the purpose of our existence. And the Mexican restaurant and Tipo Pasta Bar do suggest businesses or concepts that came up to fulfill the purpose, the central purpose of our existence. Mm. And the central purpose of our existence is to be an ecosystem that benefits. So if you open a Mexican restaurant uh, with the intention to benefit people in terms of uh, providing them a job, pay, providing them good food, a good experience, uh, and if it doesn't work out, then no sweat, close mm. it down, open something else that can serve the same purpose. And I've always thought that the hallmark of a great leader is that when he runs an organization, it's great. And when he steps out, the organization still runs like mm. clockwork. And I think that is what makes Black Hole Group successful. If, if something were to happen to me today, I'm very confident that the Black Hole Group will continue to run because the culture has been embedded so deep that you can't pull it out. You can take me out of the Black Hole Group, but you can't take that culture, that the, those values that's been instilled in Black Hole Group out. And on top of that, I think uh, over the period of the pandemic in the past few years, we've proven that uh, with this understanding of leaning back on the purpose and the value of the Black Hole Group, we've been able to pivot, pivot and been uh, malleable. You know Bruce Lee, what he said, right? Mm. Be like water. water uh, yes. Yeah. And that we are able to take the shape of any cup that we're in, any circumstance that we're in, and we pivot. Mm. You know, because the restaurant or the concept and how we earn money, that does not matter as much as what we stand for. Mm. And that's how we are at where we are today. Right. As a leader, you know, um, what values do you hold dear to your heart let, let me just share with you a story once upon a time like a very early days in the business i had about three or four restaurants and one hotel hostel and we we had about 50 people at a point in time so our rent amounted to about fifty thousand dollars a month and the payroll also tens of thousands of dollars a month after running the bis entire business for the entire month paying out the rent paying out the staff paying out the suppliers you know how much I took back for myself? $300. Yeah. After I all that imagine. effort. Month on month on month. Mm. And that's on a good month, by the way. Yeah. Although on a bad month, is maybe $150. I can understand. A pocket yeah. money, you know. So I, I got a bit jaded and disillusioned. Mm. So I went to see somebody whom I really respected. And, uh, and I, I spoke to him and I told him... You know, I think I'm gonna just sell the business. It's not it's not working out. Uh. I think my, my previous job that I was working at paid me more than ten times that amount for doing so much less. Now I'm doing so much more for ten times less. And I make the landlord angry because sometimes I pay the rent late. I make the staff uh, annoyed at me because I always demand things from them. Uh I'm really tired because I work 18 hours a day, I don't have enough sleep. And at the end of the day, if I earn millions, it's fine, but I earn $300. So <laughs> how does this make sense? Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, is this how you look at business? The money that you get and take home like $300, is that how you look at it? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, have you not seen what you've created? You've created an ecosystem that benefits. Mm -hmm. Sure, you take home $300, but the money that you've generated for the economy, the amount of money that you've disbursed to your staff, and this amount of money he saves up every month to get married, to buy a house, to have a child, 
to feed that child and you you basically harness an entire family and then with that money you are paying uh, the landlord who pays off his mortgages the suppliers who also run their own businesses yes you only take home $300 but the millions that go through your platform this is an ecosystem that benefit and that entirely changed my perspective of, of how I run business you know a business is not only a profit making entity a business has the ability to rejuvenate society and to to benefit the people around you so so for me that is the value and the way that i see the business and that's how everything is born out of mm, right so i'm sure you had fears and doubts when you first started out because you you were in the civil defense force uh-huh. and then you switched careers right yeah. and you went into an industry that was completely unfamiliar to you yeah, absolutely i mean <laughs> That's insane. What prompted you or what gave you that confidence to just jump right in and do that? You know, I recently read read a book and it spoke about doubt. There was a discussion that asked like, where does doubt come from? Mm. And then like, you realize that not many people can answer that because where does doubt come from? But doubt actually comes from the lack of certainty. So certainty is something that you know. One is one. And if you don't know what that is and then that is where doubt comes from. So to decrease doubt, you increase certainty, mm. right? So if my, my philosophy in approaching this is that the world is such a complex place that there's only so much that you can control. But the thing that you can control, you need to be certain about. And that is what I put my focus on to try to increase that certainty in that matter, to eliminate that doubt. Mm. Yeah. Did that doubt, you know, in your early years cost you anything? No, for sure, for sure. Like one of the biggest doubts I had was that when I graduated from university, I joined the SCDF as a uniform officer. And I did, I think I did pretty well, like getting promoted. I had a very good trajectory in my career. And I gave that all away to start a business, to go and scrub toilets, (laughs) change bed sheets, clean up after people. Because I started a hostel, right? Obviously, like there are days where I asked myself like, I was a uniform officer managing people and now I'm cleaning up after people's mess. Something is not right. Lah. Yeah. So those kind of doubts always like played in my head. Mm. But I kind of fo- put my focus on the things that I can control and continue working on that. Mm. Yeah. So throughout the years, what mindset did you hold on to to soldier through every challenge? I think over the years, I've gotten better at being equanimity you know not mm. to not to overreact when something bad happens or not to celebrate too much when something good happens mm. so whenever i go through a tribulation i don't look at it as something that i have to suffer i look at it as an education mm. i look at it as character building i look at it as something that we can learn from and when something goes my way, I learn not to over-celebrate because I've seen it one too many times that when a restaurant launches and it's in trend, people flock to it. A few months later, and it doesn't do well and then you find yourself in an awkward situation where, oh, I thought it was great and now it's not. And this patience and gratitude is my guidance, my crutch towards better success towards striving for excellence mm. because once you get out of this then you are you could be in a state of heedlessness you know because you think that you've done so well and you're complacent but if you don't have patience as well once a tribulation hits you you don't know how to handle yourself and some people are driven to depression anxiety and even suicide uh, so you need for me i at least subscribe to these two values mm. and i feel like this guides me along the path. Right. It's so interesting that you mentioned that because um, when we speak to people, you know, um, who are trying to start an entrepreneurial journey or any type of effort or endeavor that they're going on, sometimes as they're moving through that journey, they often say that, oh, I don't feel the joy. Even as they hit milestones, has that been the case for you throughout your successes? You get a bit numb sometimes. Because sometimes you do one and you do two and it's great and you feel like, you know, I got the Midas touch. Whatever I open, whatever I start, it will do well, you know, until the pandemic came and my whole worldview was shattered thinking that, wow, everything I do is wrong right now. Mm -hmm. And then that's where the the patience part comes in to try to understand, to try to take a broader view on what these problems might mean for us. And in turn, for for me, it gave me clarity on our, our sense of existence why we existed because before we existed just to to latch on opportunities and open new restaurants but now we existed because of the purpose 
creating the ecosystem for, that your, benefits. for your team yeah. and everyone else in mm. their families. Now, you mentioned the pandemic, right? I think it was life-shattering for everyone, mm. but more so for the F&B industry. I think it was really challenging. What was the most valuable lesson that came out of that for you? For me, I think amidst all this mess, yeah, there was so much problem flying around and then you're kind of in the eye of the storm. Yeah. You got to kind of look around and say, okay, what really matters? Is it to make money? Is it to survive? Or is it to take care of our people? Or is it to retain the integrity of the brand and take the hit and take the loss? But in six months or in six years, whatever the time may be, right, we can bounce back because the, the brand name is still intact. And we decided that's it. We are in for the long haul. And that's how great brands in America and Europe, you're talking about Rolex watches, you're talking about BMWs, they stand the test of time. Mm. Because at certain periods in history where there were crises, they took it in the chin. And they said, you know what, we'll take this loss, but the brand name stays. And that's how you build empires and that's how you build pyramids. Mm. And that takes like some rewiring of the brain and the mindset into what kind of work and intellectual energy we put in and where. Mm. Yeah, because at that point in time, it couldn't be profit. Yeah. It's, nothing is profitable Pretty at that point well, in time. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's got to be based on building infrastructure, business conventions, and the brand name. Right. And how did you, you know, um, trickle down these values and ethos to your team? So for me, is that. Before that, as a founder of one small cafe, for example, <clears throat> you are the founder, you are the business owner, but you're also the barista. You're the, also the person who washes up and wipes the table and cook. So you're yeah. everything. So when you have an idea, it's actually executed quite easily because you know exactly what, exactly what want. I want and then I go back and I design it. Yes. But when the company is bigger, right? And growing. You have to know what you want and be sure of what you want because once it gets out there to 100 people, that's inertia. First of all, you have to convince them that, like, hey, this is my idea. I can't execute it without all of you. So I need to convince all of you first. And you, as the leader of the company, you better be sure that that's the right idea because there's inertia, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the F&B industry is a very labor-intensive mm. industry, right? From your perspective as a leader and from your early years as far, what remains the most stressful part of being in this industry? <laughs> <laughs> F&B is tough not because of, like, if you break it down, it's not difficult to pour water into a glass. It's not. But F&B is difficult because it's a million of these small things happening simultaneously. Yes and grinding at you every single day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And it just takes one problem to mess everything up. Everything will crumble. Aircon is down, that's it. You can't run a restaurant. The tap water, is, there's rust inside, that's it. You cannot make so many so many kinds of food and drinks and coffee for the day because mm -hmm. water is rusty, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is the, the challenge. There's so many cocks in the wheel that you have to make sure that every one of them are done right. And then you get to sell a burger for $10. <laughs> and all that's that, the best part. All <laughs> that. Just to sell... One burger for, for $10. $10. And, and you have to sell 1,000 of that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as the CEO, you don't you don't just see a problem and you solve a problem. You have to deal with all the circumstances and all the situation around it and try to reconcile all of them. Right. Now, if you were to take away one or two core lessons in the last 12 years, mm. what would that be? So if you're talking about a time period, I grew from a founder of a business to a CEO of a business. And I think it's important to stress that there is a very distinct difference between the two because a founder of a chicken rice shop is a founder of a business. But that does not necessarily mean that he's a CEO mm. of the business, right? And a CEO who is employed to run an organization is not necessarily the founder of the business. Mm. Yeah. So for me to be able to straddle and grow from a founder of a small business to growing it to a large organization and now helming and running it as a leader of the organization, it's, it's something that I guess you can go to school for, uh, but the nuances of it, it really cannot be taught. Taught. For example, when I was a younger business owner, right? Just to call a plumber to come and throw it's expensive, dollars. yeah. Before the parts and the, re uh, the repairs, it's really $200 has to come down. Yeah, so I thought, you know what? Why don't I learn how to repair a toilet bowl? So I learned how to repair a toilet bowl. I learned how to run like electrical wiring mm. and whatnot. Yeah. 
And then when you run a company, you have to have the, the MBA level, you know? So you learn how to manage finances, you know how to move human resources, you know how to run an organization. So from plumbing to electrical work to running an organization, it's two different skill sets all together. Yeah. And some of these things you can you can learn in school, but at the end of the day, the learning is in the doing. Yeah, then right. you make the mistake and then you fail miserably then you and then back. you get back up again and you say you know what I understand why I feel and now I learn to do it better and it's still not perfect mm. yeah. and you're learning every day I'm still learning every day. day it's you know the founder and the CEO part right how do you draw that line that balance right because as a founder you have a vested interest yes. it's in so a, it's it's so tricky right it's because so tricky. you have a vested interest this is something that you founded there's that mm. passion and that mm. love for that for what you're doing mm. there but as a ceo you know um like you mentioned earlier you get a hired ceo to come into the business right and they they come in but they have a very clinical mindset yes. because they're outside of that exactly that founding journey right you cannot yeah you cannot be more spot on yeah so, Funnily enough, it, this is a conversation I've been having with my partner for uh, the past few months. Re very recent, I've been trying to convince him that we should set up a board where I sit as the chairman and he sits in the in, in the board as well. And we hire a CEO to run the organization, keep an arm's length. And this guy will run the organization in a very pragmatic, clinical fashion mm -hmm. and with very clear KPIs on what needs to be done what needs to be done because when the founders are involved there's very blurred lines you know because on the one end you have to run an organization you have to let go of people right and it's hard it's difficult yeah. you have to make very difficult decisions but on the other hand you are also founders so you have compassion you know that it's not just about running a business it's about maintaining that relationships ecosystem. yeah the ecosystem so it's very blurred lines it's worked for me for the past 12 years but I think it's time that we kind of consider a different dynamic being a founder and CEO is great for the first decade mm. at least in my case because as a founder uh, there are certain value values and merits that you bring to the table and then as a CEO you also learn to to be a bit more transactional yes <laughs> <laughs> transactional yeah so yeah. in the early years what sort of advice or would you give for you know entrepreneurs who are I, where they're wearing both hats sort mm, of right this is a bit cliche but it's a right of passage you know you have to go through it there is no shortcut a lot of younger people they see the top of the mountain and they think that in a snap they can be there oh. so I uh, went to Kinabalu to climb wow mountain, right? <laughs> So to get to the peak, of, it's about 4,000 feet. And at 2 a.m., you continue climbing, it's dark. You know, you just have a torchlight. And then all you can see is the next step. And then you take one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. And then three hours of one step at a time, <laughs> and the light starts to come up. And then you turn around, and you see the entire world just beneath you. And you think, wow, I got this high up by doing it one step at a time. And I think this is a good analogy for business going through the process that you want to get to the top, but you have to go through the rite of passage and take it one step at a time. And mm -hmm. you have to trust the process and the map or whatever, right? That you're going to get there. You're going to get there, but you have to go through that difficulty of inclining, mm -hmm. right? One step at a time. Right. Now, you know the one step at a time that you mentioned, right? Mm. Sometimes people get there and then halfway through, they just they like, back. they fall back. Yeah. And yeah. They, <laughs> maybe they fall back once or twice. And then the third yeah. time, they're like, okay, I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. How did you carry on, like, you know, with surviving the pandemic? Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, in between, you had your own uh, challenges. Actually, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I was about to say that sometimes it's not one step at a time. Sometimes it's 10 steps forward and then nine, nine steps, steps backward. backward. And that is, that is really the case. But you have to also step back, take a breather, turn around and look at the view and how far you've come. Mm. And then you realize, yeah, I have made strides forward. Because sometimes it feels like you haven't. You've done this and done this and you earn $200 a month and you realize cannot and you look behind like hey actually can you've come I? far actually, yeah. can. <laughs> so is there anything that you do to mentally prepare yourself each day before you walk into your I constantly remind myself of my core values to be kind to people to make things easy for people 
to not be sucked in into the small matters because sometimes small matters can really put you off the track like yes, for example uh, coffee is not nice <laughs> and then you put puts you in the bad mood and then you start scolding people and then you feel like oh, everything is not right and then you go into this downward spiral you know and then when when that happens and that happens also because i'm only human right and then I try to recenter myself and think, okay, what is my purpose? What is most important? Then you realize that what really matters is to make people feel comfortable and to to make people feel good about themselves and to have like good relationship. And then if you play on that platform, I think you can never go wrong. Mm. Uh, do you believe that in leadership today, you know, after 12 years, do you believe that, you know, you, you there's some views that, you know, uh, compassion shows weakness in leadership some people believe that compassion is vital in today's leadership what would mm. be your thoughts on that as, as a leader myself you kind of look for guidance a lot so i do read a lot of leadership book and I, I find this about many leaders and there's this term in the arabic language called haiba mm. haiba it, it's a combination between fear and love and niccolo machiavelli wrote this as well in his mm. book called the prince uh, where where there was a discussion about fear and love. What kind of leadership style is better? Is it better to be feared or is it or better loved. to be loved? And Machiavelli is of the opinion that it's better to be feared. Love is great, but as a leader, you need to be feared. But uh, I think Haiba is something a bit more special than that, where the element of fear is still important, uh, but that doesn't mean you cannot love. So if you study like somebody like Alex Ferguson mm. and you study the players that played for him, people feared him, but people loved him mm. because of the way that he treated people. He knew every single person working in Old Trafford, the, the caretaker lady, the cleaner, mm. he calls them by name and checks in with them. When uh, one time, I remember this anecdote when Ronaldo, his dad was ill, I think. Uh, he said, you know what, Cristiano, take your time, go and visit your family. The game is important, but it's not as important as your dad. So yeah. go, yeah. take the time you need, and when you're ready, you come back. Right. And then I think that touched Ronaldo's heart. And yeah. this is a world But he was also leader. hard on him when he needed yes, to be. Yes, exactly. So I think yeah. being a leader, you need to have wisdom and to have that knowledge of how to manage fear and love and to manage people, right? It's important, that knowledge. But you also need to have that wisdom to apply it at the right place, at the right time, the right people. And it differs. Sometimes mm. people are weak and you, you cannot to, be firm when, yeah. at that point in time. And sometimes people are... Are strong and they are motivated and that's where you can be a little bit more firm. firm. So I think understanding all of these tools in the toolbox and then apply it at the right place, right time, the right people, I think that's important mm. and that's wisdom in leadership. Right. Especially in F&B, right? You mm. have different people coming in all the time. Manpower is the turnover. All turn sorts over. of people yeah. and I deal, I deal with people from different backgrounds and from different social economic statuses mm. who speak different lingo and uh, a lot of our staff are also not from Singapore. We've got Thai, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, we've had from Korea, we've had from Europe, a few of them. And, you know, one style of Asian leadership would not work because... Right. It's you know, different somebody, nationalities. We've like had three French staff who worked in my group and and their, their understanding of working is very different from an Asian society, you know. So you kind of have to learn the psyche of these people from where they're from. And then you realize that leadership transcends cultures. It does. If you understand leadership and how to manage it and apply it, it transcends cultures. Mm, right. Yeah. So speaking of that, you know, um, you started in an industry where you had no experience, right? So the early years, you may have had some challenges, naysayers. What were the, some of the biggest misconceptions that people had of you or the Black Hole Group? For me, I started out really young. Uh, when I graduated from uni, I, I worked in SCDF for about three and a half years. Uh, and then I left SCDF at about 26, 27, and I started mm. the business. And in, in the process of the business, we have had to, you know, meet stakeholders, banks, uh, potential partners. And every time I turned up for a meeting, oh, you are Mustafa. I expected an older person and you're just a boy. <laughs> We're not boys. <laughs> Right. How did you uh, overcome that perception? I think at, at the end of the day, it's about the substance that you bring to the table. How you look, your etiquette, your comportment, how you dress. And those are important things as well because the first impression counts. But at the end of the day, you can look beautiful and... Put together. Put, put together and then you lack the substance and it will tell over time. Or you can look torn and tattered and disheveled. But when you speak... 
you bring value to the table and it's got substance and people will realize, you know what, this guy, he has something that, to he, give. There's something, yeah. Mm. That's why people always say, don't, don't judge a book by its cover mm. because you just never really know what What's somebody's behind. been through and why they made certain decisions in their lives and why they decide to dress like that. Mm. All right. And uh, I think... Another question that I wanted to sort of like round up our conversation is, you know, the F&B industry is th thriving, especially now with the halal uh, industry as well, right? And that's very nice to hear because, you know, all these young entrepreneurs are also coming up. So how do you think it's going to be in the next couple of years? And um, how do you think the Black Hole Group will continue to contribute to it? Uh, if if you don't mind, right, I have to kind of like correct you. Okay, no yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, because the FMB industry is not thriving at all. Uh, in fact, as long as a decade or two decades, we've seen the highest numbers of closures, uh, closures, bankruptcy, liquidation case cases. You see FMB companies just plowing on with the optimism that things are going to get better. Mm. Uh, you know, when, when the pandemic first came out, then the economists came out and say, you know what, this pandemic is going to hit the globe. Everyone's going to be affected. And it will take the world six years to recover. When I heard that, I laughed. I thought like, six years? <laughs> what is this guy thinking? Obviously not. Lah. Soon, one year is going to be open up and things are going to be back to normal. And now I'm living it, you know. Four, yeah, years, four years on, we are still in it. Yeah. It's just that uh, the pandemic itself has been lifted, uh, relieved of it, but the effects of it, it's we are still living for the FMB it. especially. F FMB, I I think for all industries, mm. yeah. Uh, interest rates are still high. Uh, we are adapting to the new norm. Uh, consumer habits have changed a lot. Uh, and also you compound that with um, internet TV. There's Netflix, there's social Disney, media. Yeah, social media. So people don't go out as much anymore. Um, and then. There used to be a supper culture mm. where you go to a prata shop. Um, everyone's gathered there. Everyone's gathered there because there's just no social media. There's no TV. So you just go out. After the last show on Channel 5, you go out and you hang out with your friends. And now the supper places are not that busy anymore. There's also delivery where even if you really need to have supper, you just order on, on you one of the platforms and come. it gets delivered to you. Yeah. So that social dynamics have changed and it's here to stay. It's not as if people are going to Flip around. Flip and just say, you know what? We miss those times. Let's do it again. This is the new norm. Mm. So we do have to deal with that and, and accept that. This is the, the reality that we are facing with and how do we deal with this new status? Mm. All these things have unintended consequences and FMB's industry is affected. But complaining is not going to cut it. This is the, the social circumstance and we kind of have to deal with the changes in the dynamics. So in essence, to answer your question, the FMB industry, there is a lot of potential. That's for sure. But it's not thriving and FMB owners and entrepreneurs, they, we kind of have to understand what is happening. Mm. People mm. do need to eat, yes. But is it more deliveries? Is it more catering? Is it more home kits so that people can cook at home? HDB or the private condos, are they building houses with smaller kitchens that enables them to cook or not cook? Yeah, so all this, I see it as social engineering and we have to understand that so that we can cater our product to suit mm. the market. Yeah. That's really incredible. So what advice then do you have for upcoming f and Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> Don't do it. Don't come into this. No, I think, I think you got to really touch your heart and ask yourself why. Because at the end of the day, there's this term in Arabic called your act actions are by your intentions. And you really have to understand why you do it. If you want to open a burger bar because you love burgers, that's just not going to cut it because you love burgers. But is it going to pay your bills? Is it going to pay your rent? Is it going to earn you the money? Because a lot of younger people do it because of pa passion and passion alone. Yep. Passion for burgers. I mean, I don't know what, what you like. Uh, bubble tea. You bubble like bubble tea? tea? Okay, sure. You like bubble tea. But does it mean that you can pay your rent, your bills, your... Selling Buy bubble house, tea. They're selling bubble tea. And when the times are great, good, maybe you can. But when the times are not, are you going to break down and cry? Are you going to go into depression and give up? Because your purpose has got to be deeper than just liking bubble tea. It's got to be a purpose that is willing to be pummeled with trials and tribulations. And you're still standing there and say, I love it enough 
to, to keep going. O- to keep going and only take three hundred dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key, isn't it? At the so end of for it, younger yeah. entrepreneurs, I think they really have to dig deep yeah. and ask themselves why are they doing this? Because opening a cafe, a lot of people will say it's sexy, like, like you know, everybody wants to open a cafe. But when it's great, then it's great. When you get a publicity for six months, then it's great. But when it's not, then how are you going to deal with that? In twenty four months, when your company is down in the dumps. You're not making money, and your staff boycotts you. What are you gonna do? If you're gonna give up, then you shouldn't start in the first place because mm. that day is gonna come. You I'm not trying to, to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to scare them, but uh, but you gotta visualize that. And then if you think that you have what it takes to be resilient, and you have that mental fortitude to go there, and you know Winston Churchill said, "Never waste a crisis." And if you feel like you're you're that kind of person that can look at a crisis and say. There's an opportunity. Then maybe yeah, go for it. Mm. Yeah. And even then, it may not be enough because over time you got to build that mental fortitude. Like the little, the little losses in life. You lose your wallet. How do you react? You fall down. How do you react? When your kid falls down, you feel like mommy cuddling, but you feel like you know what? Let him fall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So all these little things in life, how you react, will accumulate to the bigger thing to prepare you for the bigger challenges challenges okay. so yeah thank you so much no problem, uh, Mustafa. My it's been wonderful having you on the podcast thank you, I and feel i feel honored and privileged thank you so much and uh yes that's all thank you okay and to our listeners thank you for tuning in to this episode of open house remember for every question you have there's somebody out there who has the answers if you enjoyed today's episode please subscribe leave a review and share it with anyone who might benefit from this you can also follow us on our socials for more updates so see you next time